Some say the first and second seasons of Prison Break are definitely among the most classic in the history of American TV shows, with the third season slowly descending from its pedestal, but once you've seen the third season, you'll realize that even taken on its own, it can outclass 99.9% of current American TV shows. Michael is locked up in the notorious Sona prison, and upon arrival, he finally understands the true meaning of hell on earth. The inmates are the most vicious criminals from all over Panama. Due to frequent riots, the government has decided to step back, retreating outside the prison walls and setting up guard posts, leaving the inmates to fend for themselves. Anyone daring to step half a step out of the prison gates would be instantly turned into a beehive of bullets. Even a tiny mouse. Once a month, the guards deliver some drinking water and food, and casually take away bodies, no matter how they died, to ensure no one is faking death. They would shoot the bodies a few more times before burying them in a pit outside the secure area. In this place, where there are no rules or order, only the law of the jungle prevails. The prisoners follow a bloody tradition, if someone throws a chicken foot at you, it means you must duel, and you cannot refuse, until one of you is dead. <laughs> Michael witnesses this brutal slaughter on his first day in prison, no matter how smart he is. There's no place for him to use his brains here, as it seems to be filled with unevolved barbarians. The next day, Mahone finds Michael and suggests they escape together. Given Michael's expertise in breaking out of prisons, but Michael flatly refuses, because it was Mahone who killed his father, and if it weren't for Mahone's relentless pursuit, he wouldn't be in this situation. Upon leaving, a boy wearing a McGrady jersey shows unusual enthusiasm towards the new American inmate. As he was talking about McGrady's miraculous 35 seconds, 13 points performance, his expression suddenly changes, and he quickly runs away with the basketball. Let's go, Blanco. Orientation. I'm not interested. It's not for you to decide. The person is Sammy, the winner of last night's chicken foot throwing duel. Sammy is taking the new inmates to meet Lechero, the leader of Sona Prison, surprisingly, in such a dirty and chaotic place. Lechero's room is a world apart. Not only does he have women serving him, but his room's furnishings are also vastly different from the other inmates. Turns out, Lechero was once a well-known local drug lord, and even after being captured, he still had relatives on the outside to handle affairs for him. Lechero enjoys certain privileges by bribing the head guard, managing the prisoners of Sona Prison. The reason he called the new inmates over was to intimidate them and assert his dominance. However, Lechero didn't notice his woman, Mary was completely enamored with the handsome Michael. Lechero emphasized that conflicts must not be resolved privately. If you have a problem with someone, throw a chicken foot to challenge them to a duel, fighting one-on-one -on -one until one party is dead. Men with poor mental strength were so frightened they wet their pants. Right here. You're a brave man. You're a brave man. You're lucky I've been meditating. Before I couldn't take my finger off the trigger, but now. After establishing his dominance, Lechero lets the others go and then turns to scold Mary. He has a good man. Right, mommy? He's not you. Not compared to you. <gasps> Lechero, although ugly but still have a sense of self-awareness, looking out of the window that handsome face Lechero heart full of jealousy, Michael never imagined his good looks would bring him such deadly trouble. In the afternoon, when he returns to his cell, a burly man suddenly rushes in. Before understanding what's happening, world is choking Michael, muttering that Michael stole his stuff. The hypocritical Lechero arrives just in time and orders Sammy to search the bed, where they indeed find a small package of drugs under Michael's bunk. Michael then realizes this is a blatant frame-up. But what use is knowing, when World, weighing 300 pounds, has already thrown a chicken foot on his table. Balak hasn't eaten for three days, and looking at the muddy, dirty water, he couldn't help but stick out his tongue to lick it, but even such water, the old inmates were unwilling to spare for him. This is Belik's third day in Sona prison, where he hasn't had a drop of water or a grain of rice, and even his clothes and shoes have been stolen by other inmates. At this time, the kind-hearted Sapo helped him up. They are the lowest status inmates here, 
and beggars do not have the right to be allocated food or drinking water. In the afternoon, Bellic noticed that Sapo suddenly had a new pair of shoes on his feet. Sapo said nothing, just glanced at a body not far away. Bellic also wanted to strip the clothes off the body, but then Sammy, the second in command of the prison, ordered them to clean the toilets, saying they would be given food after the work was done. One more word from you, and I will drown you in here, you understand? Sammy threw them a stinking mop and ordered them to take the trash to the sewer to burn it after cleaning, but after the work was done, the person distributing food gave them only a gnawed bone. Sapo could no longer tolerate such inhuman treatment. He glanced at a slightly loose security window in a cell and stealthily climbed up, pulling hard, and finally tore the security window down. Sapo jumped the three-meter-high fence, dragging his broken leg with him as he ran recklessly outside. Bellic shouted not to do it, but it was already too late. Michael also saw the scene. In this hellish Sona prison, inmates are like ants, and nobody cares about their life or death. After losing his companion, Bellic had to clean the toilets alone. But when burning the trash, suddenly a whistle came from inside the sewer wall. Bellic looked through a crack in the bricks and saw a person hiding inside. The man asked him for a favor. Bellic initially didn't want to pay attention, but the person directly pushed a strip of meat through the crack. Although Bellic realized it was rat meat. To him at that moment, it was a delicacy. The man said if he wanted more meat, he had to stuff these two notes into the pockets of the two people who were going to duel today. And the people who were to duel were Michael and a 300-pound world. Just yesterday, Lechero, jealous of Michael's good looks, had world accuse Michael of stealing his stuff and threw a chicken foot at Michael. This is a unique ritual in Sona prison. If there is a dispute, the only way to resolve it is a one-on-one -on -one unarmed duel until one party is dead, and the chicken foot is the token of challenge. At that moment, with the crowd's violent mood at its peak, Michael fiddled with the chicken foot in his hand, never imagining he would bet his life on such a thing. More ironically, the only person willing to help him was Mahone, who had been chasing him outside the prison. Mahone helped him because Michael was his only hope of escaping this prison. As a combat expert, Mahone reminded Michael that a kick to the opponent's knee could easily take down even the strongest enemy. Under the watchful eyes of the crowd eager for a spectacle, Michael stepped into the center of the arena. One step at a time, Bellic emerged from the crowd, wishing him luck while stealthily slipping a note into Michael's pocket. At the same time, he used the same trick to slip another note into World's pocket. Lechero reiterated that no weapons could be used and no cover sought until one party was dead. As Lechero gently waved a red ribbon in his hand, the life and death duel officially began. But at that moment, Michael suddenly shouted at Lechero. I'm not gonna fight! Taking advantage of World's distraction, Michael swiftly kicked at his knee followed by a series of punches that knocked World down. Seeing that World couldn't move, Michael turned around and left. But the crowd stopped him with a fierce look on their faces. Think you understand the rules, friend? Only one man comes out alive. World struggled to stand up, and the two were once again locked in a deadly fight. With the opponent's movements hindered, Michael executed another combination, knocking him down again. But at that moment, Someone in the crowd threw World a knife. Taking advantage of Michael's intention to leave, World picked up a small knife and stabbed back at Michael. In a critical moment, Mahone intervened with a swift move, adding a chokehold to neatly take down the cheating World. No weapons! Rules are rules, remember? And if we don't have them, we're savages. Seeing his plan to eliminate Michael fail, Lechero turned and returned to his room without looking back. Not long after, the once-a-month visit from the guards brought drinking water and food to the prison, and they also took away several bodies from inside. Worried about anyone faking death, they shot the bodies a few more times before transporting them outside the isolation area to be left in the wilderness. After the guards left, a woman pretending to be a relative of an inmate came to collect the bodies. She searched each body and finally found the note in World's pocket. Seeing the content, the woman smiled satisfactorily. Michael, confused, wondered what the mysterious notes Bellic slipped into their pockets were for. Just then, Michael's brother Lincoln came for a visit, now a cleared and legal citizen. However, Lincoln brought a piece of news that left Michael in utter despair. Talk! Dad. Dad. I'm so sorry. They got me in, Sarah. Please. 
do what they want, Dad, please. It turns out the company had kidnapped LJ and Sarah and threatened Michael to break a man named James out of prison, this was exactly why the general had gone to great lengths to get Michael into Sona prison, there's a kind of people in the world who can adapt to various environments like chameleons, in Fox River State Penitentiary, he was the notorious leader of the white gang, commanding respect and fear, as long as you held his pocket, no one in the prison would dare to lay a finger on you, and today is Teabag's first day in the infamous Sona prison, seeing that the boss, Lechero, had dirty shoes, Teabag immediately ran over, kneeled on one knee, gestured for Lechero to place his foot on his knee, and declared that shining his shoes was an honor. During the shoe shine, Teabag makes a small, deliberate mistake and then pathetically claims he's a wreck. A sign of weakness that makes Lechero lower his guard. After a few days of flattering and pleasing, Teabag secured the position of the third in command in Sona prison. Meanwhile, three old acquaintances who arrived on the same day each fared worse than the other. Belik became a prison beggar, begging for leftovers from other inmates. Mahone, suffering from severe bipolar disorder and without tranquilizers in the prison, was becoming increasingly unstable and desperately wanted to escape. Michael, because of his good looks, attracted the attention of Lechero's woman, leading Lechero to try every means possible to have him killed. To make matters worse, a mysterious company kidnapped Sarah and LJ and demanded he bring a man named James out of the prison. However, Michael searched the entire prison and could not find this person, McGrady, who had been in for three years, told him that here, no one did not want to find James. Just a few weeks ago, James killed the son of the Panama City mayor in a bar fight. After being sent to Sona prison, he disappeared without a trace like vapor. The mayor offered Lechero a deal, if anyone could kill James, the murderer would be given a chance for a friendly court decision, meaning anyone not guilty of a particularly serious crime could leave and regain their freedom. As they were speaking, Sammy, the second in command of the prison, got into an argument with someone and accidentally knocked over the newly arrived drinking water. The inmates in line were dumbfounded, knowing that in this place, the value of that barrel of water was comparable to gold. The guards won't deliver water again until two weeks later, meaning without this barrel, the inmates are likely to die of thirst. Sammy was Lechero's man, but the inmates didn't care who was in charge here. One of them started leading the others and cursing under Lechero's window. Luckily, Michael was near the front and got half a bottle of water. From a distance, he saw poor Bellic licking the valve. Suddenly remembering the note Bellic had mysteriously placed in his pocket during yesterday's duel, Michael approached Bellic to ask about his purpose. You slipped this note in my pocket yesterday. Why? My memory's a little foggy on account of this thirst. Bellic confessed everything about the person hiding in the sewer wall. Michael guessed this person might be James and hurried to the sewer. When Michael said he was there to help him escape, the person inside finally responded. It turned out to be James, who knew that once outside, all the inmates would want him dead, which is why he had hidden in the sewer. Michael asked him to hold on for a day or two more, until he figured out a way to get him out. But when Michael came out, he didn't notice Mahone had set his sights on him. Meanwhile, more and more inmates gathered in the square, clamoring for Lechero to come down and explain. Lechero called the guards, but they said the water truck couldn't arrive until the day after tomorrow at the earliest. He had no choice but to ask Teabag to bring a small bucket of water for each of them to take a sip. However, when Teabag walked through the hallway, he encountered pitiful Bellic again, who wanted to sell information to Lechero in exchange for survival. Boy, you won't be drinking your own urine before you get any of this. I got something. Oh yeah, you got yourself the untouchable status. Teabag thought for a moment, helping Bellic could solidify his position in Lechero's eyes. So why not do a favor? Thus, under Teabag's introduction, Bellic finally met Lechero and spilled everything about the person hiding in the sewer. Lechero knew right away this person must be James, so he quickly sent a few men to catch the person in the sewer. When Bellic came out of Lechero's room, he was dressed in a belly shirt and leopard print pants, holding a cornbread in his hand. Michael, ever so clever, saw Bellic well fed and clothed and immediately understood what had happened. He rushed to the sewer only to find not only Lechero's men there but also Mahone with a crowbar twisting James out. It turns out that when he spotted Michael coming out of the sewers, he also got the information from McGrady and got there first. Smashing through the wall and grabbing James, Michael pleaded with Mahone not to kill him, promising to find a way to escape together. But Mahone wasn't foolish, killing James would grant him freedom, so why bother with extra steps? As the standoff continued, 
James took the opportunity to break free and escaped back into the sewer. Michael knew well that catching James in such a confined space was only a matter of time, and lingering here would not alter the outcome. So, he hurried to Lechero's room, wanting to make a deal. Michael said, I'll solve your drinking water problem if you give James to me. Lechero scoffed, saying he'd ask Michael's old acquaintances if he was trustworthy. Can I trust this bobo? He's a snake. He stabbed me in the back every chance he got. A snake who stop a man in the back. I never hear of such a creature before. As the riot outside grew worse, Michael sought another chance but was sternly sent away by Lechero. Perhaps his only option now was to secure drinking water first. The only way to save James. This man tore his underwear into strips tied them into sections, and then soaked them in a barrel of strong liquor. He then gathered some old plastic bags, poured all the liquor into them, and finally used the knotted strips to tightly seal the bags, creating a completely enclosed space. Just like that, a makeshift deep-sea bomb was made. Michael concealed it well and took it out of the cell. In the scorching heat of over 40 degrees, the prisoners, enraged by the lack of water, reached their boiling point. Some even stuck their tongues into the dry valves. If no solution could be found, not only would Lechero's position be at risk, but there could also be a loss of life. Without delay, Michael hurried to the sewer. He touched the walls of the blocked water supply system above. Where there was water, there would be dew, making it clear where the blockage was. After determining the approximate location, Michael opened the maintenance hatch of the water supply pipeline. He slowly lowered the plastic bag along the pipe wall, perfectly blocking the pipe. Finally, Michael struck a match and ignited the fuse. The flame quickly spread down the alcohol-soaked strip. With a loud explosion, the blocked water pipe was blasted open, and the entire prison shook. Before anyone could understand what had happened, water was already gushing out of the valves. The prisoners scattered, rushing to the water outlet to enjoy the rare coolness. With this move, Michael managed to preserve Lechero's dominance. Although Lechero despised Michael, he was burdened with the guilt of numerous murders. Even if he killed James, he couldn't leave prison. Thus, he might as well owe Michael a favor. So he handed James over to Michael and promised that no one would ever touch him again. Michael breathed a sigh of relief. Now, he had to plan how to escape with James. But before that, Michael needed to ensure Sarah and LJ's safety. Meanwhile, he prepared for all eventualities. While Michael planned the escape from inside the prison, Lincoln attempted to rescue Sarah and LJ from the outside. To ascertain their location, Michael had Lincoln inform the company that he must speak with Sarah today. Lincoln goes to Susan B., the company's contact, and says flat out that my brother won't break out of prison until he talks to Sarah on the phone. Susan B. thought this request wasn't too excessive, as it was just a phone call. So she agreed without hesitation, but Michael soon discovered that the prison's phone lines had been removed long ago, and the only phone that could contact the outside was in Lechero's possession, although Michael had just helped Lechero avert a crisis. Lechero, seeing Michael as a thorn in his side, flatly refused to lend him the phone. The only option left was to seek help from Teabag, who was thriving under Lechero's wing. But since it was Michael who had sent Teabag to this prison, why would he help Michael? I'm like your new compadres, I know who you are, what you've done, and who you've done it to. Let me get this straight. You're saying you gonna tell on me? Michael continued to threaten Teabag. If you don't help me, I'll spill everything about your pedophilia and rape. Panama is a religious country. If they find out about the filthy things you've done, do you think you'll see tomorrow's sun? This tactic worked wonders. Teabag immediately admitted his fault. While Lechero was getting a haircut, Teabag quietly stole the phone. Make that 26 minutes till he gets back. If that phone ain't back on the cradle, we're both dead, you hear me? Because my Alabama ass is not going down alone. After getting the phone, Michael immediately contacted Sarah. They seemed to be catching up, but Sarah was subtly hinting at her kidnapping location. It's like they're giving you until midnight and I'm sitting here at 3 a.m. However, Sarah was cut off after just a few words. Based on the limited information, Michael guessed that Sarah was kidnapped in a small town 20 kilometers away. With the Victory Tower landmark visible, Michael immediately called Lincoln to search for her. However, as Michael was giving the crucial location, Lechero and his men arrived. Michael quickly hung up the phone and put it back, but he was trapped and couldn't leave. At the critical moment, Teabag came to the rescue. Let's go! 
There's something you should know. What? I think that barber might have. You got me? No. No, my mistake, Andy. No, in fact, that, that there might just be the best shave I have ever seen. <laughs> what? It looks like you need one today. How much you do that? <laughs> you can't be walking around looking all, uh, boop. Lechera was amused by Teabag. Looking at Teabag's fawning face, Sammy hated to go up and give him two slaps. Meanwhile, Lincoln had arrived at the base of Victory Tower. But because he couldn't hear the specific location, he was in distress. Sarah saw this from her room and took off her shoe to throw it out the window. Sarah. Lincoln hurried after it and stumbled upon LJ, being held hostage. LJ! In the end, LJ and Sarah were taken away in a van by the company's people. Lincoln was very disappointed. Just returned to the Hotel Susan B's phone call. Go check the underground garage. I've left a small gift there as punishment for your foolishness. Apprehensively, Lincoln went to the garage and saw a blood-soaked box from afar. Inside, to his horror, was Sarah's head. The next day, Lincoln visited the prison with a grim face. Unaware of what had happened, Michael slipped him a note asking Lincoln to prepare the items listed on it. Because they were crucial for the escape plan, Lincoln's gaze was vacant. He wanted to reveal Sarah's death several times, but for the sake of his son, he chose to keep the secret from Michael. Bellick was sprinting towards a corpse, but he was a step too late. Another person had already snatched one of the shoes. The two of them fought over it, neither willing to back down, ultimately resulting in each getting one shoe. Bellick put on the shoe, which was several sizes too big, but it was still better than nothing. Bellick deeply understood that in the hellish Sona prison, not even a puddle of muddy water would be willingly shared with you. He went to Pistachio's cell, where two men dressed in oddly matched outfits began negotiating over the ownership of the shoe. Bellick offered to trade his body for the shoe, but the other party was not at all interested in his plump type. Seeing Pistachio pull out a razor blade, Bellick immediately backed down, but it was just a misunderstanding. Pistachio was a barber and had no intention of harming Bellick. Seeing Lechero come in for a haircut, Bellick wisely bowed his head and left quickly, after Pistachio was done. Bellick, still harboring ulterior motives, ventured into Pistachio's room again and finally found the shoe. But as Bellick was putting on the shoe, he overheard Michael and Mahone plotting something, seemingly hinting at an escape plan in their conversation. Bellick's attention is no longer limited to food and clothing. He immediately finds Michael and threatens him. Don't think I don't know what you're planning. If you escape without me, I'll expose you. But Michael was no ordinary man. With a little trick, he managed to remove this thorn in his side without affecting his escape plans in the slightest. In the afternoon, Lechero was leisurely enjoying the breeze from an electric fan while watching the World Cup when suddenly, the prison experienced an inexplicable power outage. He urgently called his men to check the wiring, but while they might handle a fight, anything with a hint of technical complexity left them clueless. Lechero was at his wit's end when he suddenly remembered Teabag mentioning that Michael was an architect. He rushed downstairs to find Michael. The food supply in Sona prison depended entirely on this phone to communicate with the outside world. If the phone couldn't be charged, all the prisoners could potentially starve to death. But Michael was in a tough spot, as the electric cables were buried underground along the prison's outer walls. To repair the circuit, the soil had to be dug up, and Michael had clearly seen a prisoner shot dead by guards for getting within 30 yards of the outer wall. Michael didn't want to risk his life. But Lechero assured him he would negotiate with the guards. Seizing the moment, Michael asked for a cell with better lighting in return. It's the first one to get sunlight in the morning. You get me that cell, I'll get you electricity. Lechero agrees. But what he doesn't know is that it was Michael who created the illusion of a short circuit. Michael had borrowed an insulated crucifix from McGrady and stuck it in the air circuit breaker. His goal was to wait for Lechero to come to him, so he could naturally request a cell change. This room offered a broad view, allowing clear observation of the watchtower and surroundings, making it the best place for an escape. Soon, with Lechero's intervention, Michael and others were allowed to dig and repair the wiring under the supervision of guards. However, before they even left the prison gate, Bellick eagerly followed, volunteering to join the digging. You're doing something here, Schofield. You're right. I am. I'm fixing the electricity. You want to help dig? Dig. At that moment, 
Balak was unaware of the big pit waiting ahead for him. Under the watchful eyes of armed guards, several prisoners dug up the cable along the wall. Michael opened the junction box and secretly buried a small object inside, then covered it with soil. Balak, who saw this, quietly took the opportunity to leave and ran to Lechero's room within minutes to report on Michael. Balak couldn't fathom Michael's plan. Knowing he couldn't join the escape team, he thought it better to use this information for some tangible benefit. Bellic told Lechero that Michael had buried something underground, not knowing what it was for but sure it was in preparation for an escape. After detailing Michael's ingenious maneuvers from the first season, Lechero was shocked. Lechero immediately dragged Michael outside, forcing him to dig up the soil to check for tampering. Open it. Move the dirt. Now. It's duct tape. To fix the frayed wires is why the power was so inconsistent. I didn't want the tape to come loose, so I packed it down with dirt. Although no flaws were discovered, Lechero still did not trust Michael. He demanded that he accompany Michael to the electrical room to turn on the main switch. When they arrived in the basement and Michael saw the crucifix in the back of the electrical box, his heart nearly leaped out. To avoid detection by others, he had to close the switch on another electrical box. As expected, the power still didn't come back. Under Lechero's instruction, an irate Sammy swung a punch, and Michael, taking advantage of the situation, fell back against the electrical box and quietly removed the crucifix. Michael went on to say that there must have been a delay in the transformer for the call to come in after so long. Lechero and his man, not being particularly educated, were easily fooled. After this incident, Michael got his desired cell, and Bellic was summoned to Lechero's room by Lechero himself. Sammy forcefully pushed Bellic onto the table. Lechero slowly poured a cup of scalding coffee, walked up to Bellic, and lifted his shirt. Michael touched a clothesline in his cell before approaching the window, where he saw a janitor digging a hole next to a body that was nearly rotting. The janitor picked up a canister next to him and began spraying a chemical on the body, while a sign on the nearby wire fence starkly warned of high voltage. Michael, adept at spotting flaws and minor details, seemed to have thought of something. From this moment on, the plan for Prison Break 2 Zero officially commenced. In the hellish Sona prison, it was almost a daily occurrence for prisoners to die from hunger or duels. Guards would take the bodies out of the prison every so often. To prevent people from faking their own deaths they'd even put a few more rounds in the body and dump it outside the quarantine zone. Over time, this gave rise to a relatively well-paid outsourced profession, the gravedigger. Gravediggers would spray a chemical called Kesslever on the bodies to eliminate the stench of decay. And this chemical could corrode steel once heated to a certain temperature. This provided Michael with an opportunity for his escape plan. But before that, they had to deal with the gravedigger to ensure he would inadvertently spray some of the chemical on the wire fence during his work. Michael reached out to Lincoln, who came to visit, asking him to bribe the gravedigger from outside the prison. Michael was attempting to escape because a mysterious company had kidnapped his girlfriend, Sarah, and his nephew, L. J with the aim of having Michael extract a man named James from the prison, but Lincoln doesn't know what to do because the company killed Sarah last night. But to save his son and to ensure the escape plan didn't fail, Lincoln had no choice but to keep the truth from his brother. As for why the company was so determined to get James out, James explained, he said he was a sailor who often took people on sightseeing tours at sea. A year ago, he had hosted an oceanographer, but since then, Government officials had continuously asked James to take them to the areas the oceanographer had visited. Fearing trouble, James hid in Panama until he accidentally killed the mayor's son and ended up in prison. The message sent out through the body was for his girlfriend, Sophia, to retrieve a book on birds. This book on birds was actually a navigational log that only he could understand. To return to the places the oceanographer had visited, one would need the help of this book. But Michael had no interest in these matters. That's between you and the company. I just need to get you out of prison. After that, I want nothing to do with you. Meanwhile, outside the prison, James's girlfriend, Sophia, learned about the escape plan from her boyfriend. Since their goals aligned, she joined Lincoln to assist. Since Lincoln also needed a local translator, he agreed to have Sophia accompany him to bribe the gravedigger. However, when they found the gravedigger, he shockingly demanded $15,000. Fortunately, it wasn't their money to spend. Lincoln made a call to Susan B., the company's liaison, but when they arrived with the money, the gravedigger greedily demanded more. 
Unable to tolerate this, Lincoln grabbed the insatiable man and pinned him against the car. Susan B. told Lincoln to stop and let her handle it, then began to rummage through her bag. No, 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 no! I... What the hell are you doing? We need him! He will sell us out to the cops after he takes as much as he can from us. Killing the gravedigger marked the failure of the escape plan, but luckily, when Lincoln visited again, he told Michael that they'd slipped some money through other channels and arranged for someone they trusted 100% to fill in. Initially confused, Michael rushed to see who the new gravedigger was. Michael smiled in relief, surprised to find it was his loyal friend Sucre. So, what had Sucre been doing during the days he was apart from Michael? Sucre had been searching for his girlfriend Mary Cruz's whereabouts, learning that Bellic, who had kidnapped Mary Cruz, was sent to the same prison, he even visited once, under threat. Bellic finally revealed the truth. In that house in Mexico, he hadn't detained Mary Cruz and Sucre's aunt but had forced them to leave at gunpoint. This meant Mary Cruz was safe. After leaving, Sucre managed to contact Mary Cruz, but halfway there, he remembered he was still a wanted man in the United States. Going there would only implicate Mary Cruz, and without money, he couldn't support her. So, he decided it was better to stay and earn money to send to her. On his way, he happened to meet Lincoln, who told Sucre about Sarah. Sucre also learned that Michael was in prison, as a good friend of his. How could he stand by and do nothing, just as he also need to earn powder money for the children? So he agreed to Lincoln as gravedigger, with Sucre's help. They successfully opened a gap in the fence. Now, all that was left was to deal with the two guards in the watchtower to make their escape from the prison successful. A man tossed a piece of breadcrumb out the window, successfully luring a mouse to come for a snack. All was calm around, without a stir in sight. Michael then wrapped another piece in foil and threw it to the same spot to test if the reflection could alert the guards. However, the next thing they knew, the patrol car's headlights suddenly lit up outside the wire mesh. The spotlight from the watchtower shifted towards the mouse, and with a single shot, it was reduced to mush. Michael was terrified. It seemed nearly impossible to escape at night. The next day, Michael sought out McGrady in prison to help him buy two watches and a pair of binoculars, but McGrady only took half the money, as the binoculars, which only the stubborn Guillermo owned, were something he would never sell. Michael found out where Guillermo's cell was. Although he doesn't want to steal someone's beloved treasure, he decides to steal the telescope for the sake of their great escape plan. Michael drew a map on the ground and informed James that the escape would begin the following afternoon. James laughed, having never heard of a daytime escape before. Michael explained that it was a necessary risk, as patrol cars guarded the area all night, and daytime security was relatively lax. The reason for choosing the next afternoon was because of a World Cup final at 2 p.m., when most inmates would be gathered in the yard watching the game. They could take this opportunity to climb out from the window in their room. The only obstacle now was the snipers on the two watchtowers. They had to find their weaknesses in order to make an effective escape. Michael split the binoculars in half, each observing a watchtower, while Mahone was in charge of keeping watch at the door. After hours of observation, James noticed that at 3.13 p.m. M., the sunlight directly hit the west watchtower causing the sniper there to habitually shift his gaze outside the prison. James threw a ball to test his theory and found that the western sniper did not notice the situation inside the wire mesh. And this lasted for about six minutes. The captain of the Northern Watchtower, Ortado, was a true sports fan and would not miss any World Cup matches. Michael noticed that whenever there was a poor signal, Ortado would fuss with the antenna, also momentarily ignoring their side. This meant that if they could overlap the times the guards were distracted, they could slip through the corroded wire mesh hole and escape from prison. But how could they precisely control the actions of both men? Michael thought of a way. He stole a microwave and modified it into an electromagnetic pulse emitter to disrupt electronic signals. James had to admire the company's knack for picking people. Michael was indeed a unique escape genius. Michael plugged in the emitter, and as expected, Ortado started frantically messing with the antenna. But just then, someone passed by the cell door. Michael was momentarily distracted, and the sunlight reflected off the binoculars accidentally shown on the watchtower. By the time Michael looked again, Ortado had already aimed his gun at him. Get out! Why? They're coming in! The prison immediately sounded the most severe alarm, and all inmates scrambled to the yard, knowing they would be shot on sight if they didn't appear there in time. Michael and the other inmates kneeled neatly on the ground, followed by a squad of fully armed guards storming in. Rifle scope was seen from the tower. 
Capitan Hurtado saw it with his own eyes. It's impossible! There is a gun in your prison, and it was pointing at one of my men. We are going to find it. It turned out the guards mistook it for the glare of a sniper scope. After a thorough search, they found the binoculars in Michael's cell. Holding a gun to Michael's head, Hurtado demanded to know why he was being watched, leaving Michael too scared to speak. At the critical moment when Hurtado was about to shoot, James stepped forward. Why were you watching him? I, I wasn't. I was, uh, I was watching birds. He pulled out the bird book his girlfriend had given him from his pocket. Upon seeing the bird illustrations, Captain Escamilla thought he was just a bird enthusiast and decided not to pursue the matter further. Cobarde. Hurtado. Ya, déjalo. Having narrowly escaped trouble, Michael rushed back to his cell, only to find the door firmly locked by the guards. Michael felt utterly devastated. Not only was the cell their escape route, but the microwave-turned-electromagnetic pulse emitter was also inside. Declaring their meticulously planned escape plan aborted once again, the guards slowly opened the prison's main gate, and as they brought in new prisoners, they failed to notice an old paper cup also being blown into the prison by the wind. It was this very discarded paper cup that would bring a new dawn to the trio planning to escape. After observing, Michael discovered that Hurtado always drinks coffee of this brand at noon every day. This meant that if they could find out where he buys his coffee, they could seize the opportunity to drug him into unconsciousness, then slip away through the corroded hole in the wire mesh and escape from the prison. The next morning, Michael handed the discarded paper cup to Lincoln, who came for a visit, asking him to check around for the location of this coffee and drug it before 3 p.m. After all, their escape was scheduled for precisely 3.13 p.m. that afternoon. Then, Michael inquired about his girlfriend Sarah and L. J. Wondering why he hadn't received any photos of them lately, Lincoln avoided eye contact and deliberately changed the subject. But Michael sensed something was off and made a stern statement, if he doesn't see a live photo of them an hour before the escape, he wouldn't go through with it. Lincoln was in turmoil because Sarah had been killed by people from the company. If he told the truth, Michael would definitely not escape and then his son would surely be killed. But after coming out, Lincoln still asked Sophia to inquire about the brand of coffee. Sophia, a native Panamanian, recognized at a glance that it was from a shop a few kilometers away, where the guards must have bought their coffee. Without wasting a moment, Lincoln rushed to find Susan B. He asked her to urgently prepare a photo of Sarah alive and to procure a drug that would take effect an hour after being ingested. At noon, Lincoln and his group were already staking out the coffee stand and indeed saw Hurtado, who regularly came to buy coffee. Lincoln prepared the drugged coffee and pretended to accidentally knock the coffee out of Hurtado's hands. Here look, uh, this is a, a buddy's, please, please, I insist. Just as Hurtado reached out to catch it, the shop owner unexpectedly offered him another cup for free. Lincoln felt utterly despondent, seeing the plan nearly fall apart. Sophia quickly unbuttoned a few buttons on her blouse. Excuse me, senor. I just need to go to Sona. I, I, my car ran out of gas. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm heading in the wrong, the wrong direction. I'm, I'm I not. really need to go to Sona. Hey, mi amor. Yo te llevo. Venga. Taking the drugged coffee, Sophia followed him, and as expected, halfway there, Hurtado's lustful nature took over. He leeringly said, you must have a relative in prison. If you're with me, I'll arrange for you two to meet every day. In a moment of quick thinking, Sophia claimed, you guessed right, my relative is actually Lechero. Upon hearing Lechero's name, Hurtado's face drastically changed, as he was just a regular guard who dared not mess with Lechero's woman, while Hurtado was distracted. Sophia quietly switched the coffees, with only an hour left until the escape. Lincoln immediately sought Susan B for the photo, but upon opening it, Lincoln was shocked to find the photo was exactly the same as the last one, still cut out from a newspaper. Do you think my brother is an idiot? Here's the pictures. He's gonna want to see this close up. I'm done doing favors for you. Get out. I'll see you in an hour. Lincoln was utterly speechless, with no other choice. He had to reveal to Michael the truth about Sarah's death. She's dead, Michael. I lied to you. I'm sorry. If you don't break out today, they're gonna kill my son. This news hit Michael like a thunderbolt, and he walked away without looking back. In order to rescue his beloved Sarah, he risked beheading to escape from prison. Now that Sarah is dead, what's the point of escaping? Not only that, but his brother had lied to him for so long. Michael went to the yard and without saying a word, 
threw a chicken foot at James, since the company was so ruthless, then he would kill James first. Under the certification of Lechero in the prison, both men returned to their cells to prepare their wills, and 15 minutes later, they were scheduled to duel to the death on the playground on time. In the corridor, James was in a daze. He couldn't understand why Michael, who had been trying to get him out of prison, wanted to fight him. However, at that moment, a hand landed on James's shoulder. Look, I don't know what you're thinking, but killing me is not going to solve your problems. I'm not going to kill you. Then what the hell was all that about? You want to make it out of here without being seen? You need a diversion. Now we have one. It turned out this was also part of Michael's escape plan. Although Sarah was dead, he still needed to save his nephew, LJ. He deliberately provoked the duel to attract all the prisoners to the playground, so they could take this opportunity to escape from Sammy's cell in the prison. It was now 3 p.m., and there were only 13 minutes left until the sniper on the watchtower would be drugged and unconscious, and only 15 minutes until the duel, meaning they had just two minutes to escape from the prison. Without delay, the two needed to prepare for the escape within 13 minutes. Michael, having stolen a tattoo machine, rushed to Sammy's room. James took out the rope ladder they had made from hammocks. The playground was abuzz with noise. All the inmates gathered in anticipation of the life and death struggle. Michael disassembled the head of the tattoo machine and placed it at the point where the wire mesh met the wall. Using the noise as cover to hammer vigorously at the iron window. After breaking open the window, Michael tied one end of the rope ladder to an iron post. At 3.12 p.m. M. Hortado on one of the watchtowers drank the coffee laced with a sleeping drug and soon passed out. Slumping over, now, there was only the other guard on the watchtower left to worry about. Michael and James kept a close watch on their watches, waiting for the 3.13 p.m. sun. <laughs> But unexpectedly, today's sunlight arrived a bit later than usual, and the other guard was slow to move his position, just as they were getting frantic. A blinding reflection of sunlight finally arrived, and the guard finally turned his head away from the prison, allowing the two to remove the security window and prepare to act. But just then, rapid footsteps were heard in the corridor. It turned out Sammy had come back to grab something, causing the two to quickly hide under the bed, barely daring to breathe. Sammy felt the dust on the desk. And though he sensed something was amiss, his eagerness to watch the duel made him overlook it. After Sammy left, the two hurriedly dropped the rope ladder and began their action to ensure James's safety. Michael went down the rope ladder first, but just as he landed, a large cloud slowly drifted over. Seeing it about to cover the sun, Michael urgently instructed James to climb back up. Was our only chance. Fortunately, the guard didn't notice, but this also meant the escape plan had failed. Michael felt a deep despair but knew they had to quickly pull the rope ladder back up. As James was untying the knots, Lechero sensed something was amiss and hurriedly sent his men to search the rooms for them. Hearing their shouts, James could only hastily place the rope ladder on the windowsill, but before they could take a few steps, they were dragged up for the duel. As they passed Lechero, Michael tried to call off the fight claiming it was just a small misunderstanding and they had already made up. But the crowd's mood was already stirred up, and calling off the duel was like a pipe dream. Well, must be Let's go. With no way out, the inmates pushed them to the center of the arena, where they stood looking at each other, not knowing whether to laugh or cry. Seeing that they were hesitant to fight, people started throwing stones at them, and James, in a bid to survive, made the first move against Michael. As they fought, a breeze caused the rope ladder on the windowsill to begin sliding down quietly. The other guard on the watchtower also noticed something was off since he hadn't seen Hurtado for a while, so he quickly sent someone to check. The guard who came up realized Hurtado had been drugged and immediately grabbed the binoculars to look towards the prison, just in time to see the rope ladder blown down by the wind. The guard was shocked, realizing a prisoner was attempting to escape, so he immediately grabbed the walkie-talkie to alert his superiors. Moments later, a large number of armed guards headed towards the prison, and a series of urgent siren sounds erupted, forcing the deadly fight inside the prison to come to an abrupt halt. The fully armed guards pushed open the door, and the prisoners, well-practiced, knelt with their heads in their hands, daring not to make the slightest move.
You come down here. Now, we are going to find out who is behind this. Colonel Escamilla demanded to know who cell 212 belonged to, but in prison, snitching on a fellow inmate is a despicable act condemned by all. The scene fell into a deathly silence, and seeing no one speak up, Escamilla decided to make an example of someone. You are one of the milkman's boys, eh? Is it yourself? Papo glanced at Sammy, although he wanted to say it was Sammy's room. Sammy was the second in command in the prison. Snitching would eventually lead to his own demise. As Papo hesitated, Escamilla did not give him a chance to speak. Everyone was terrified, but Escamilla did not intend to dig deeper. Instead, he turned his attention to Lechero. I allowed you to conduct your business here, to bring in your prostitutes, in exchange for simply keeping these inmates in line for me. You can't even manage that small task efficiently. In a moment of anger, Escamilla even revealed a shocking secret to everyone present. It turns out the reason Sona Prison was lacking water and food was all Lechero's doing. Lechero and Escamilla had made a private agreement to block Sona Prison's water pipes and control the timing of food deliveries by Lechero to consolidate his ruling position here. But now, Escamilla had lost trust in Lechero. Maybe we just backed the wrong horse. Hmm? Perhaps there is another in here. Better suited for the job? Good luck. Breda. Escamilla finished and took all the guards away, leaving only the disgraced Lechero behind. Lechero, stripped of his dignity, faced the scorn of inmates who began spitting at him. From this moment on, Lechero's ruling position in the prison began to crumble, and the one responsible for all this is the man who tried to escape from the prison. Lechero knew well that if someone was planning an escape, there was only one person most likely to do so Michael, who had been acting suspiciously every day. Sammy, furious, grabbed Michael and brought him before Lechero. Just as Sammy was debating whether to fry or stew him, to everyone's surprise, Lechero snatched the knife from Sammy's hand and pushed Michael into a secret room. Are you trying to break out of this prison, Mrs. Schofield? No. Are you trying to break out of this prison? We both know that's not possible. Answer me or else! What do you want me to say? I want you to tell me the truth! I want to hear it! You want a reason to kill me? No one! The next second, Lechero actually cut the ropes binding Michael's hands. Lechero was clear in his mind that he had already committed a serious crime and staying here would mean certain death. He might as well join Michael in his escape attempt. You are breaking out of this prison, Mr. Schofield. And you're taking me with you. Meanwhile, General Krantz, the boss of the company, also learned about the failure of the prison break, and he had no patience to wait any longer, so he directly instructed Susan B. to rob the prison violently. Susan B. came for a prison visit and informed James of the company's plan to violently storm the prison, also instructing him to find an opportunity to eliminate Michael, while Lincoln outside would be dealt with by them, but what they didn't know was that their meeting was clearly observed by Michael. Staring at all the windows in the prison fortified with a foot-thick layer of reinforced steel, Michael felt a deep sense of frustration. The escape route he had meticulously planned was now completely sealed off. But in order to extract James, whom the mysterious organization desperately needed out of prison, he had to come up with another plan, and fast. The reason was urgent, he had only four days left before the final deadline for the escape. Otherwise, his nephew LJ would meet a grim fate. Just when Michael was at his wit's end, Teabag approached and handed him a letter. Upon opening it, Michael found a sketch of Lechero's room, seemingly marked with the time and password for entry. At 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the two arrived at Lechero's room and entered the password according to the instructions on the sketch. The first door opened as expected, and they passed through a narrow storage room. To Michael's surprise, there was a second door at the end of the corridor, he tried the same password he had used before, but he didn't realize that James had quietly pulled out a dagger. It turned out that following the last failed escape attempt, the company had lost patience and decided to storm the prison violently at 5 o'clock that afternoon. They had instructed James to make sure Michael was eliminated before leaving. Just as James was about to strike, footsteps were suddenly heard in the distance. The newcomer was Lechero, who had recently joined the escape team. To prevent Michael and James from escaping on their own, Lechero had not marked this door's password on the sketch. Thus, only he knew it. Lechero led them to a whole new world. It turned out that Sona Prison once had areas A and B. After a riot in the prison last year, the guards blew up the underground passage connecting the two areas. 
all prisoners were moved to Area B, and Area A became the guard's luxury apartments. Lechero had once wanted to dig through the passage to escape but ultimately gave up due to the enormity of the task. Knowing Michael was a structural engineer, he figured Michael might have a solution. Yeah, I mean a couple of payloaders. Jokes aside, if horizontal digging wasn't feasible, perhaps vertical digging upwards could work. This way, they could reach the vicinity of the prison's wire mesh, waiting for the right moment to escape through the previously corroded wire mesh. However, the difficulty in digging upwards lay in the need to install supports within the diameter of the hole to prevent collapse and avoid being buried alive. Yet, James seemed utterly uninterested in the new escape plan, as there were only 45 minutes left until the violent prison break. Upon exiting, Michael took the initiative to close the door, asking Lechero to clarify the exact location they would emerge in the entry area. But just then Sammy goes to the storeroom to serve the newly recruited henchmen a drink, and Michael and James rush to hide in fear. Lechero, of course, couldn't let Sammy know about the escape. Offer them something good. Don't make me look the fool. They promise for me, Sammy. Oh, you have a problem with that? So he refused Sammy's request. This snub led Sammy to harbor thoughts of rebellion against Lechero. After Lechero and Sammy left the storage room, Michael made a beeline for the second door. Now, knowing only he and Michael were downstairs, Lechero couldn't kill Michael, so James had to hide the dagger. Hey, I'm Lechero is the code. We don't need a code. I'll get inside. While Michael races to dig through the tunnel, James is on pins and needles, claiming to suffer from claustrophobia and unable to stay in confined spaces. James hurriedly ran outside. Lechero arrived in the storage room just in time to say Sammy had left, and Michael very reluctantly followed him upstairs. After coming out, Michael looked everywhere for something to support the tunnel, but he accidentally found James on the rooftop, nervously staring at the ceiling. Michael walked over and casually removed the ceiling panel, revealing a narrow space not suitable for someone with claustrophobia. Hate to break up the brew, ha ha, gentlemen, but Lechero would like to see you. He says it has something to do with your big brother. Michael went to Lechero's room, where it turned out Lincoln had called about something very urgent. Since Michael had once stolen Lechero's phone, Lincoln knew Lechero's phone number. After calling back, Michael learned that an agent had attempted to shoot Lincoln outside but Lincoln had managed to turn the tables. Considering James's strange behavior that day, Michael finally realized what was going on. They don't need us anymore. Here we go. They're breaking him out on their own. By then, James had climbed onto a platform, waiting for the company's rescue. Michael hurried to the spot where he last saw James and also arrived at the rooftop. The two exchanged blows in a fierce fist fight. <laughs> Meanwhile, a guard in the watchtower spotted the helicopter, but he couldn't make out the faces of the two escapees. After reporting the situation to his superiors, the guard was immediately taken out by the helicopter's gunman. James kicked away from Michael and grabbed hold of the rope ladder as it descended. Michael rushed over and took a flying leap to hold onto James. He believed that if James got away, LJ and he would both be silenced. More and more guards gathered below, and the helicopter's gunman was also taken out. Unable to withstand Michael's pulling, the two ended up back on the rooftop. The rescue mission ended in failure. Mission failure, return to base one immediately. The cunning James quickly got up jumped down through the ventilation shaft, and even managed to take off his shirt in the process. The prison alarm blared urgently at that moment. Michael also ran back to his cell to change clothes, but as soon as he came out, he was caught by a guard. When Michael was dragged to the yard, it was already filled with kneeling prisoners. General Zavala scrutinized each person's face and finally approached Michael, ordering him to stand up. You've been in Sona prison for less than a month, and two major escape incidents have occurred. Tell me, is all this just a coincidence? Although Michael tried his best to explain that he was not involved, Zavala slapped him to the ground. You've caused too many problems here in Sona. So maybe you shouldn't be here in Sona. Give me Say goodbye to Sona, Mr. Scofield. This was the most brutal punishment in Sona prison. In the scorching heat nearing 40 degrees Celsius, Michael was confined in a cage made entirely of iron, which was covered with a plastic film that allowed only his head to breathe. It's well known that iron conducts heat exceptionally well, 
and the plastic film creates an effect where heat gathers but hardly dissipates. Anyone spending a day in this steam cage would inevitably turn into a dried corpse, devoid of any moisture. Zavala demanded that Michael reveal the origin of the helicopter that attacked the prison, but Michael, fearing the company's retribution and their propensity for breaking promises, stubbornly refused to speak. Only minutes after being locked up, Michael was drenched in sweat and nearly fainted. He tried several times to muster the strength to tear off the plastic film, but severe dehydration had taken its toll, making even standing up a luxury he couldn't afford. Of course, Zavala couldn't let Michael die so quickly, he ordered his men to bring a cup of water. Coincidentally, Gravedigger Sucre came to bury a body and, seeing Michael on the brink of death, offered to help him drink. Seeing Sucre, Michael found a bit of strength to stand up. He knew this cup of water wouldn't save him. Michael had already given up hope on survival, but after persistent persuasion from Sucre, Michael drank the water. Michael urged Sucre not to get involved in the escape plan anymore and to leave Panama to reunite with his wife and child as soon as possible. However, Sucre, bound by a deep sense of brotherhood and loyalty, secretly resolved to rescue Michael. As the sun became increasingly vicious, Zavala occasionally came to tempt Michael, promising that he could return to an air-conditioned room immediately if he disclosed the identities of the attackers. Michael was well aware that the mysterious company's reach and power were far beyond what he, a mere prison warden, could contend with. Moreover, if he revealed any information about the company, his nephew LJ would certainly be killed. However, Zavala told Michael a story that subtly changed his stance. In Panama, there once was a notorious drug lord backed by an army of hundreds of thugs. They committed unspeakable acts of violence against anyone who stood in their way, to the extent that even the government and police dared not confront him directly. People said he was unstoppable, but now, this drug lord was personally delivered into Sona prison by me. He is Lechero, whom you all know, and now, I hold the power over life and death for Lechero. From the moment I got here, I've been planning my escape. He's talking. How do you know? You can't get out of the box any other way. Seeing Michael being released from the steam cage, James panicked because McGrady had told him that prisoners locked up there were never released unless they cooperated. In Zavala's air-conditioned office, Michael divulged everything about the company, James, and the plot against his brother. It didn't take long for Zavala to bring James in for interrogation. What's he talking about? You know nothing about this? No. Schofield's a smart man, but uh, he's got a rabid imagination. So you're calling him a liar? More or less. The next second, Zavala ordered a set of torture tools to be brought in, but before the electric plug was even inserted, James, fearing for his life, confessed everything. Are you working with Scarfield? Yeah! Yes, I'm working with Scarfield! James revealed that his contact was Gretchen Morgan, who had orchestrated the violent prison break, but he didn't know Gretchen's address. Michael said he had a way needing only to borrow Zavala's phone. Mike. Michael. What phone are you on? Just listen to me. I need to know where and when your next meeting with Susan B is. Garfield Price building downtown in an hour. Why? Garfield Price. One hour. Soon, Gretchen, who was meeting with Lincoln, was captured and brought back but she claimed she didn't know James. Zavala, not wanting to waste words on Gretchen, immediately started torturing her. Abre la manguera. Yes or no? No. You prove one thing. This is not your first time. Faced with a tough nut to crack, Zavala then had James and Michael confront Gretchen directly. Under James's identification, Gretchen had no choice but to confess. However, she claimed she was just a runner and that the real boss was in a place tens of kilometers away. She could lead Zavala to him. Zavala is a man of action. Without a moment's delay, he immediately took Gretchen to capture the person, but he overestimated himself. To capture the head of the company, he only brought a driver. As expected, as soon as Zavala opened the warehouse door, Gretchen took the opportunity to attack, and both were killed. The news of Zavala's death quickly spread to the prison. With the leader dead, 
the investigation into the escape had to be temporarily suspended. Under the escort of prison guards, James and Michael were once again brought back to the prison, although there was tension between them, they had no choice but to continue working towards their common goal of escape. This is the most classic scene of Belloc in the Prison Break series, where you will witness the birth of the legendary boxer, Belloc. Upon his arrival at Sona Prison, he was barely clothed, licking mud from the ground, enduring utter humiliation, by scavenging clothes from dead bodies, he successfully obtained a pair of shoes along with a naval revealing outfit, leopard print pants. Today marks Belloc's 15th day in prison, and he's no longer the newbie who knew nothing about prison life. Yet, when someone vomited on the ground, Sammy's minion, Octavio, still demanded Bellic clean it up. Bellic knew that showing weakness here would only invite more bullying, so he pretended to be fierce and pushed Octavio away, not anticipating that Octavio would step on the vomit. However, Bellic returned to his cell only to find a chicken foot on his pillow. He was dumbfounded. This was the most brutal duel token in Sona Prison. If someone throws a chicken foot at you, it means you must duel, and refusal is not an option, until one of the parties is beaten to death. Terrified, Bellic immediately sought Lechero, hoping he could stop the duel. But Sammy, already revealing his ambitions to become the new leader and insisting on protecting his own, bypassed Lechero and announced the duel would take place in 15 minutes. Lechero hears him in the room and asks Sammy why he's holding the duel without permission. He's the boss here. But Sammy only responded with a contemptuous laugh. It's not your place. Maybe it should be. Sensing a looming disaster, T-Bag, fearing for his own safety if Lechero falls, immediately sought out James, who was planning an escape. To make a deal, if he could eliminate Sammy, he would be included in the escape team. After all, if Sammy took over, accessing the storage room to dig the tunnel would be impossible. James agreed to Teabag's request without hesitation, the yard was buzzing with noise, and the betting odds reached a staggering 100 to 1, as no one believed Belloc, looking like he was six months pregnant, could survive. Belloc, extremely nervous, was frantically searching for something, once he found it, his eyes lit up, and he wrapped his fists with cloth strips like a boxer about to enter the ring, then, mysteriously, he stuffed cotton balls into his nose. Octavio, with his eight-pack abs, was already eager. Bellic, wearing an inappropriate belly shirt and shuffling in small steps, made a dazzling entrance. However, before Bellic could look cool for even a second, Octavio hit him in the face with a headbutt, followed by a barrage of punches and kicks that left Bellic powerless to fight back. Octavio exuded the aura of a king. Unexpectedly, Bellic, tough as old boots, charged forward not going for the kill but instead covering Octavio's mouth and nose. Octavio managed to break free, but suddenly he felt unsteady and his vision began to blur. Bellic didn't give Octavio a chance to fight back, using a knee strike combined with a flurry of punches, and ending the fight with a stylish uppercut. The audience erupted in cheers, and even Bellic couldn't believe he had won the fight. Excited, he tore off the cloth from his hands, loudly expressing his thrill and joy. But he didn't notice Teabag quietly observing his nostrils. Congratulations. He's a regular Buster Douglas, aren't you? Hey, what is this? How'd you get that up there, huh? It turns out, before the duel, Bellic had smeared acetone on the cloth. Acetone is a colorless, volatile liquid that acts as a central nervous system depressant. So he cheated to defeat the formidable Octavio. Teabag picked up the cloth, sniffed it, and once again, he had dirt on someone, but Bellic was indifferent. Ever since he beat the skilled fighter Octavio, Bellic started to get carried away, boasting about his fighting skills everywhere. He would explain to anyone how awesome he was and how he adjusted his mindset to win after receiving the chicken foot. With men looking at Bellic in admiration, Teabag approached the overconfident Bellic and led him away. He threatened Bellic to challenge Sammy using the same method to eliminate him or else he would expose his cheating, but if he succeeds, he could join the escape team and break out together. Escaping the prison was Bellic's dream, and considering how easily he won the previous duel, he waved his arm, eager to try. Sure enough, the overconfident Bellic actually approached Sammy. Do we come to you if we need the chicken foot? Tiger Pants. <laughs> Who you got beef with? I don't know his name, some Caribbean guy. Stole my wallet a while back. Better think long and hard before you say another word, eh? He's got this fruity little mustache and this ugly ass vest. Please. I'm begging you.
the applause from the prisoners below thundered through the sky. As no one had dared to throw a chicken foot at Sammy after so long in Sona prison, dozens had dueled with Sammy before, and the weeds over their graves were already over two meters tall. Belik was indeed a man. However, when Belik opened the acetone box, he was instantly dumbfounded, because someone had mistaken it for trash and emptied it, leaving not a drop left. Got any more acetone around here? No, that's it. Look, I can't go against Sammy straight up. I'm a dead man. If you don't kill him, we are all dead. Belik was instantly dumbfounded, deflating like a punctured balloon and reverting back to his cowardly self. However, calling off the duel was now impossible. Upstairs, Sammy was warming up. His massive chest muscles on par with Belik's large belly, with the duel time fast approaching, an extremely anxious Belik was still searching for something to replace the acetone. It's time. Stop his face, Brad! You know, this has all been one big misunderstanding. I, I wasn't talking about Sammy, it was, it was... That's him! That's the guy I was talking about! Yeah, I don't see no fruity mustache. And where's his ugly ass best, Brad? Don't worry. You stand a real chance at winning this one. But time was running out, and seeing that begging for mercy was useless, Belik could only feign calmness and raise his hands in a mock gesture of readiness. Sammy also approached the arena, pushing through the crowd and stylishly throwing a chicken foot onto the ground. However, the life and death duel ended before it even began. Under Sammy's relentless punches, Belik was beaten to a pulp, not having even the slightest chance to fight back. And in the end, he was pressed down and spun around in circles, watching Belik being humiliated. Teabag couldn't bear to look. After humiliating Belik, Sammy was about to end Belik's life with a chokehold when suddenly shouts from his men upstairs interrupted. It's Gofield! Since Michael emerged from the steam cage, he had been hiding in the tunnel with James and Mahone. Digging an escape tunnel, the tunnel was already over a meter deep, and to prevent the entrance from collapsing, Mahone and James were desperately supporting the wood planks. Michael, holding a short piece of rebar, climbed up and inserted a wedge into the gap, stabilizing the wood planks upon release. True talents don't rely on brute force but on being well-rounded and knowledgeable. However, to dig deeper, more wood planks for support were needed. With loud shouts outside, the trio was unclear about what was happening and immediately went up to check. But upon emerging, they were discovered by Sammy's men, who were armed, forcing the trio to hurriedly retreat back into the tunnel. James, running last, was tackled to the ground. To keep the escape plan secret, Mahone had no choice but to close the password-protected door, since Michael's escape attempt from Sammy's room nearly got Sammy shot by prison guards. Sammy harbored deep hatred for Michael. Hearing his men say they found Michael, Sammy dropped Bellic and ran towards the basement. Arriving at the password door, Sammy pointed a gun at James, threatening Michael to open the door. Although Michael was reluctant to let James be killed, the rational Mahone quickly stopped him. Going out was akin to suicide. Staying in might provide a chance to figure out a solution. Michael, thoughtful, carefully removed something from the wood plank. Mahone also found a stone sword and handed it to Michael for self-defense. Seeing the door remained closed, Sammy returned to the yard. Belik thought Sammy was going to kill him and immediately fell to his knees and begged for mercy. But Sammy didn't care to kill this weakling. He went straight to Lechero who was watching from the back. Come along, Norman. Let's go. Sammy threatened Lechero to reveal the password, tensions rising between them, but just then, Michael suddenly opened the door, and everyone rushed in, immediately spotting the large hole not far away. Even a fool could guess they were planning an escape. Michael no longer hid the escape plan, laying it all out and even inviting Sammy to join. But Sammy, wanting the escape plan for himself, declared that none of them would leave, and climbed up to check the construction progress. However, the next second, A massive amount of sand and soil buried Sammy alive, not even giving him a chance to scream. Mahone was the first to react, knocking down a minion beside him with an elbow strike, while Lechero picked up a gun from the ground and successfully took out the remaining minions with a few shots. Michael stared blankly at the hole. This was his first time indirectly killing someone, as he had just removed the very rebar that caused the collapse. Afterwards, Lechero dragged the bodies out, kicking Sammy's body down to the second floor, declaring his regained control over the prison. Although Belik did not win the duel, he still contributed and ultimately joined the elite escape team. Now, 
With no more obstacles within the prison, it was time to consider how to deal with the guards in the watchtowers. Though the human threats were dealt with, an unexpected heavy rainstorm plunged the escape team into another major crisis. This was the most crucial 30 seconds in the lives of the seven-man prison break team. They all held their breath, anxiously awaiting the signal to charge. As the contact outside the prison knocked down the electric pole, the searchlight on the watchtower plunged the area into darkness. 30 seconds. Go. The opportunity was fleeting, at Michael's command. Lechero was the first to climb out of the hole, followed closely by Teabag, with Bellic in third position. But at this critical moment, Michael stopped the remaining three in their tracks. Meanwhile, the three on the ground madly dashed towards the fence. However, just five seconds into their run, the backup generator restored power, and the searchlight on the watchtower was relit. <laughs> The three of them were dumbfounded, and at the moment they didn't dare to make the slightest move. Realizing their predicament, Lechero knew staying meant certain death, so he dashed towards the prison exterior, disregarding everything. But then, a volley of bullets flew towards him. Lechero fell to the ground, fortunately only hit in the chest. Bellic and Teabag were petrified by the scene, reluctantly raising their hands to surrender. Michael, hidden under a manhole cover, peeked out in feigned panic as he reported the situation above to his allies. But Mahone, ever so clever, guessed Michael had known the timing of the generator's activation all along. There wasn't actually 30 seconds, and the three captured were merely Michael's scapegoats. Michael claimed he had merely miscalculated the timing. He peeked out again and indeed found the surroundings filled with trucks loaded with prison guards, along with patrol vehicles that were usually hidden in the jungle. These vehicles were exactly what they needed to continue their escape. The guards took the three to the yard, interrogating them on how they infiltrated the restricted area. Teabag knew that speaking out meant certain death, but keeping silent offered a sliver of hope. His mind raced as he quickly thought up a suitable excuse, but he never thought that the guards just gently locked Bellic, and the death-hungry Bellic explained everything. Tunnel! Where? <laughs> Under Lechero's room! <coughs> Teabag was utterly speechless at this fool, and Lechero was nearly driven to internal injury from anger, led by Bellic. A large force immediately arrived at the tunnel entrance, now only separated from Michael by a coated door. The captain ordered his men to blow the lock off. Hearing the noise, the other escapees urged Michael to act quickly, calmly surveying his surroundings and ensuring no guards were around the trucks. Michael cautiously climbed out of the hole, swiftly hiding under a jeep. James and Mahone followed suit. McGrady, trailing last, was on edge. Even hearing the sounds of guards climbing ladders, just a second before McGrady's feet left the ground, a guards had finally appeared. Nada. Está seguro. Only then did Teabag realize they had been duped by Michael, but they could blame no one but themselves for desperately wanting to be at the front of the line. Thinking Bellic was deceiving them, Mestas punched him directly in the nose without hesitation, to prove his truthfulness. Bellic blurted out the names of the other four, suggesting a headcount in the cells to verify. The guards quickly confirmed four inmates were missing. Meanwhile, as the guards were occupied with the headcount, Michael and his group hurriedly crawled from under the jeep, using the vehicle as cover to escape the prison. When Mestas reached the fence, he found only a large gap left behind. The group ran from night till dawn, finally escaping the jungle to reach a vast beach. Lincoln, their contact had been waiting there for a long time, but with no boat in sight, how would they escape the relentless pursuers behind them? Lincoln ran straight for a mound of sand and began digging furiously. Michael had planned the escape route from the prison, knowing the beach could perfectly conceal their footprints. He had Lincoln bury oxygen tanks here in advance. Taking a boat would make them too conspicuous and easily intercepted. To evade capture, they had to disappear without a trace. He instructed everyone to remove their shoes and socks, put them in a box, and rebury it, while their valuables were sealed in bags to be carried. Mahone pleaded with Lincoln to save a photo of his son, but considering Mahone had killed Lincoln's father, if not for the fear of exposing their whereabouts, Lincoln would have wished to tear him to pieces right then and there. How could he possibly agree to safeguard his belongings? Just then, James noticed something amiss the most crucial bird guidebook, containing coordinates needed by the company, was missing. Must have fell out of my pocket. I thought you already figured out the coordinates. Well, I didn't memorize them, I wrote them in the book! In order to get rid of the pursuers behind them, they could only go into the water first. The five men jumped into the sea, 
disappearing into the vast ocean, minutes later, a large group of guards arrived at the beach, scanning the sea with binoculars, they found no trace of any boat, wondering how the escapees could have vanished into thin air, they returned to search the jungle, meanwhile, Lincoln led the others underwater towards a destination, when they surfaced, they clung to a buoy for a brief respite, utterly exhausted, but Lincoln realized something was wrong, according to the plan, Sucre should have been there with a the yacht, but the sea was eerily quiet, unbeknownst to them, Sucre was detained in the guard's office due to his fugitive status, with his phone already confiscated by the guards, now, without enough oxygen or strength to swim back, they faced the grim prospect of perishing at sea, in life, it's rare to find such a friend who, even when beaten to a pulp and buried alive, will still protect you with his last breath, yet, throughout your life, you'll encounter countless friends of the sort, when you're shining bright, they would kneel on the ground, wishing they could lick the dirt off your shoes clean, but when you fall into hard times, they'd viciously step on you and then ruthlessly suffocate you without a second thought, watching this episode of Prison Break, you'll understand why, in real life, the first type of friend is becoming increasingly rare, while the second type is as common as dirt. Just last night, the seven-member prison break team seized their chance to escape, but three were caught on the spot, while the other four, under Michael's leadership, successfully broke free. The guards gathered all the prisoners in the yard and subjected Bellic, one of the three, to brutal torture. They beat him from night till day, trying to force out of him the whereabouts of Michael and the others. However, Bellic was not exactly a loyal brother, as he genuinely had no clue where Michael and the rest had gone. Poor Bellic was knocked unconscious multiple times, leaving only Lechero and Teabag available for questioning, but with Lechero critically wounded from a gunshot, the guards could only drag Teabag, with his arm broken, towards the interrogation room. On the way, Teabag was pushed over by a guard and accidentally discovered a bird book under a car, which he had seen Michael and James valuing greatly, using the opportunity, Teabag sneakily slipped the book into his pocket. Once in the interrogation room, the guards didn't waste time talking and directly stripped Teabag of his white shorts. There's no need to refry my beans. Always with the wise talk. Never saying anything we want to hear. Now all I want to hear. Seeing his private parts about to be electrified into roasted sausages, Teabag was scared out of his wits and hurriedly hid in a corner, but then, he accidentally saw Sucre locked in the next room, thus making Sucre the prime target for interrogation. But he does! He knows everything! He knows it! Although he repeatedly stated he didn't know Michael, when a stack of files was handed to Mestas, Sucre could no longer deny it, because inside was Sucre's warrant in the USA, while Teabag smirked maliciously in the background. Soon after, Sucre, who had been knocked unconscious countless times, struggled to open his eyes, completely disfigured, yet he didn't utter a word throughout. Seeing they had hit a tough knot, Mestas decided to subject him to even more brutal punishments. As Sucre was being dragged away, he saw Teabag and Mestas laughing and walking out together. Quickly, Sucre was taken to an empty lot where the guards handed him a shovel to dig his own grave as the gravedigger. Severely injured, he managed to dig the hole. Raphael threatened Sucre again, saying if he didn't reveal Michael's whereabouts, to just lie down quietly in the pit. Even if I knew. Shovel after shovel of sand was thrown on him, but Sucre would rather die than betray his friend. Gradually, the dust completely covered Sucre's head, yet he remained dignified. Witnessing such loyalty for the first time, Mestas knew it was futile and ordered his men to pull Sucre up and send him back to prison, but just then, the phone confiscated from Sucre started ringing. Raphael said, if it's Michael calling, ask where he is. Sucre remained silent. Unexpectedly, Michael's voice actually came through on the phone. Knowing Michael was safe, a tear quietly slid down Sucre's eye. How could Michael and the others, clearly trapped at sea, appear dressed up on the streets? It turns out McGrady's father, Alfonso, had gone to the dock as agreed to pick up his son. However, upon arrival, he realized the boat Sucre was supposed to use to pick them up hadn't moved from the shore at all. Alfonso, sensing something had gone wrong, took the boat in the direction of the prison and indeed found the five men barely alive at sea. After being rescued, Michael, concerned, asked Sucre why he hadn't shown up at the agreed location and if he had encountered any mishap. Bearing the pain, Sucre calmly assured Michael he was okay. Knowing everyone was safe, 
Sucre didn't wait for Michael's response before he threw away the phone and crushed it underfoot, denying Raphael any chance of getting information. Kill me if you want. Oh, puppy. You're gonna wish we had. On the other side, with the inmates aware of the escape attempt, and with Lechero severely injured, the prisoners went on a rampage, looting and destroying everything in sight. Lechero was beaten by a group of inmates, and Bellic, trembling with fear, quickly pulled Teabag aside to hide. Surprisingly, Teabag, known for his venomous nature, shoved Bellic away, declaring his intention to save Lechero. He once saw me as a brother, now it's my turn to repay him, he said. Teabag quickly intervened to drive away a few inmates and then helped Lechero to his room, which was in disarray, with people rummaging for valuables. Lechero, angered, took out a gun from the safe, scaring away two petty thieves. As the inmates gathered below Lechero's window, Bellic quickly fled, but Teabag seemed genuinely concerned for Lechero, tenderly treating his wounds. Lechero, suspecting ulterior motives, Question Teabag's intentions. Not the last one I expect to see at my side. I take offense, Patron. I've had many foot washes. Many men have come in with sheep's clothing. Only to let the wolf come out. Whoa, whoa. I am not trying to hurt you. I am trying to save you. Save me. I'm gonna die here. Your life is in jeopardy just being with me. Not necessarily. Teabag finally revealed the truth. On the way back to prison, Mestas had told him that for $50,000, he could buy his freedom, though Lechero was skeptical. With his life hanging by a thread, he questioned the value of money now. Even if I could find the money, who could I trust to bring it in? There is one person. Teabag hurriedly called Lechero's former lover to bring the money inside. However, once Teabag received the money, his venomous fangs were finally bared. The only mercy was perhaps allowing Lechero to die with some dignity. From the beginning to the end, there was never a real chance to buy freedom with money. The venomous-hearted Teabag was only out to drain Lechero of his last value. Witnessing this scene, Bellic was so frightened that he didn't know where to put his hands. Lechero is dead! Soon after, Teabag delivered a passionate speech in the yard and distributed some of the money to the inmates, winning their hearts. Money! Made off of your backs! And off the backs of your family! Yeah! It's yours. And I'm here to tell you, I'm giving it back. After a thorough brainwashing, the inmates were boiling with blood, unanimously recognizing Teabag as the new king of the prison, though Teabag didn't manage to escape, he at least became the boss here. Meanwhile, Sucre was also sent back to prison, ironically ending up in a tragic situation for having laid down his life for his brothers. This is the grand finale of Prison Break Season 3, an episode where Michael's intelligence completely outweets the antagonist. Let's see how the exceptionally smart Michael manages to rescue LJ, right under the noses of a dozen snipers, after Michael and the others returned to the dock, changed clothes, and bid farewell to McGrady and his son. It was time for them to get down to business. The four headed to a warehouse previously scoped out by Lincoln and then called Gretchen, asking her to bring the hostage LJ, there for an exchange with James in 20 minutes, and she was not to bring any of her henchmen, but Gretchen was no fool. Her orders were to kill Michael, his brother, and LJ. Immediately after getting James back, while the brothers were discussing their plan, Mahone stepped forward and said, since what comes next is a personal vendetta between them, he would take his leave. But Lincoln was not about to let Mahone go easily, remembering that this man had killed his father. I was gonna kill you at the beach, but I didn't want to do anything that was gonna get us caught. You shot my dad in the back. I'm gonna give you the courtesy you never gave him. Now turn around. Mahone explained that if he did not pursue them, his entire family would be killed by the company, leaving him no choice. Lincoln was uninterested in his explanation, but just as he was about to shoot, the sound of shattering glass suddenly came from behind. It turned out that James had escaped through a window, 
Taking advantage of the brother's distraction, Mahone also quickly ran outside, with Lincoln now too preoccupied to seek revenge. The brothers hurriedly chased after the fleeing James, who had already jumped off a container and stolen a car from a passerby, driving away. What are we gonna do now? The brothers were frantic, knowing that losing James meant LJ's certain death. They immediately drove after him, engaging in a high-speed chase. Seeing a traffic jam ahead, James quickly abandoned the car and ran, then borrowed a phone from a passerby to call Gretchen. You need to come and pick me up. Where are you? Lincoln grabbed the phone only to find out that the person on the other end was Gretchen, revealing they had all been in cahoots. Returning to the warehouse for the exchange was no longer advantageous, so to ensure a safe escape, the brothers had to find a new location for the trade. Michael called Gretchen, arranging to meet in a crowded square where the company's men would not dare to make a move with so many witnesses around. I'm thinking public place, wanted men, police, lots of witnesses to identify you. Plaza de Francia, 10 minutes. Be alone. Round everyone up. They finally met, with Lincoln guarding James at gunpoint, while Michael instructed Gretchen to bring out the hostages. Unexpectedly, they also brought James' girlfriend, Sophia, as a hostage. You move, you're dead. Snipers positioned on rooftops had Lincoln and the others in their sights, ready to shoot them dead the moment the exchange was completed. But how could Michael possibly put himself in a disadvantageous position? He gave Lincoln a look, signaling him to leave with James. Gretchen was caught off guard, but without securing the hostages, she dared not act rashly. What the hell is he doing? I've lost him. This is not the point of the exchange. This is just a confirmation that everyone's still alive. They're alive. Let's trade. You'll get a call in five minutes telling you where to go next. And when the exchange is over, and LJ is safe, you and I are going to spend some quality time. When the exchange is over, you better run for your life. Michael then directed Gretchen to a nearby museum for the trade, sneakily taking a souvenir with him. With no choice, Gretchen led her people into the museum, but suddenly, the metal detector ahead let out a shrill beeping sound, and it was then that Gretchen realized why Michael had chosen this location. Unable to bring weapons inside, she had to hand over her gun to her subordinates and instruct them to guard the museum exits. L.J. couldn't help but mock Gretchen. Walk. Alone, Gretchen walked into the museum with the hostages, where Michael and his group had been waiting for a long time. Now, unable to play any tricks, the exchange of hostages officially began. L.J. walked over to Michael's side first, and James followed, embracing Sophia tightly. Meanwhile, Sophia urged James to give the coordinates to Gretchen and not to go with her, but James hesitated, avoiding eye contact. As Sophia pressed for answers, Gretchen finally revealed the truth. James had never been a fisherman, nor did he have any coordinates. It was all a lie he had concocted. In fact, James was a member of the company. The general had gone to great lengths to rescue him for a very important mission only he could carry out, with crucial information recorded in that bird guidebook. Heartbroken, Sophia lamented how she had given her all to get him out of prison, only to find out he had been exploiting her feelings all along, secretly working for a malevolent company. Thus, Sophia resolutely sided with Lincoln, but Gretchen was unruffled, reasoning that since the exits were blocked by the company's men, their attempt to leave was doomed to failure anyway. Michael had already anticipated such tricks and shattered the museum's glass with his elbow. Setting off the alarm, this meant everyone had to exit through the main entrance and undergo security checks. We're all walking out of here. Together. As they left, Michael and his group smoothly passed the checks, but when the guards searched James' pockets, they found the souvenir Michael had sneakily placed there, leading to James being detained. Gretchen panicked, realizing if James was recognized and sent back to prison, their efforts would have been for naught. She hastily ordered her men to act. But in the ensuing chaos, a bullet struck Sophia. Lincoln rushed to rescue her. But he couldn't stay long. L.J. told Lincoln to go. He would stay behind to take care of Sophia. As the scene descended into chaos, Gretchen and James had already made their escape. Elsewhere, a disheveled Mahone appeared in a bar, now a wanted man even if he returned to the United States. Just then, a man entered, 
None other than the refreshed James. Seemingly with a plan in mind, James had long intended to recruit Mahone. You in? I'm in. Sophia was now out of danger. L. J. handed Michael Sarah's keepsake outside. A paper folded rose. At Fox River State Penitentiary, Sarah had mentioned she disliked things that easily wilted, so Michael had given her an everlasting origami flower. Unexpectedly, Sarah had always kept it close. Michael was filled with melancholy, knowing his brother and nephew were safe, leaving him with one last unresolved matter, to kill Gretchen in revenge for Sarah. Not wanting to involve his brother's family, Michael bid farewell to Lincoln, taking the everlasting origami flower as he embarked on his path of vengeance.